Well, it is, a, it is a privilege to be with you guys this morning. Um, I'm grateful to Pastor John for giving me the opportunity. I was sitting there thinking this morning, this was actually the church I preached my first sermon in a long time ago. Uh, that time, I had been through a year of Bible college, and I knew everything. Now, after five years of Bible college, four years of raising support and going to language school and Seven years of being a missionary in Madagascar, I'm pretty sure I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. So we'll see how this goes. But uh, if you would turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. When we first arrived in Madagascar in 2011, we spent about a year in the capital learning the Malagasy language. We had just spent a year in Quebec learning French. So once that was done, we were thoroughly confused on what to say. But we moved out to Maintaranu, and uh, Richard and Charity, right after we got there, they had to leave to go on furlough, and we took over uh, watching, taking care of the ministry there. At that time, there was four believers in a group of about 60 people that were coming every Sunday. And for the first three and a half years of the ministry, the focus of the ministry is evangelism. Uh, it's really hard to teach a church of unbelievers what spiritual growth is when they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. So, that, I mean, it was evangelism week in, week out. And I tell you, it gets challenging at times when, when every sermon has to be an evangelistic sermon. Well, then in 2015, when Charity was diagnosed with, with cancer, and we had to quickly, if y'all remember, we had to leave our furlough here, cut it short, and head back to take over. At that point, not knowing what was going to happen. We didn't realize at that time the Lord's plan was that He's going to take charity home. Um, but it was becoming very evident that we were, going to be, we were going to be responsible for the ministry. I tell you, the past three and a half, four years in Madagascar have been some of the hardest time of my life, but it's been some of the, uh, some of the I'm not going to say the best. That, that would sound too positive. The Lord has been working through it in incredible ways. And I am finding that oftentimes, right before God does His greatest work, are the darkest days. A lot of times before you see God move in just the most incredible fashion, you come to the most hopeless state you'll ever see. And so I am learning. I haven't arrived yet, but I am learning. When, when I get to a place where I say, I, I see no hope here. I have no idea what's going on here to say, look, just, just wait. God's about to do something. doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun, but it will be good. And in the past three and a half years of, of, of having the privilege of, of pastoring a church that went from four, four believers that were literally just baby Christians to now we have probably somewhere between 25 to 30 that are saved. And going from that, that work of, of, of teaching basically the gospel. Sunday after Sunday, to now beginning to, to work on discipleship and, and helping them to grow and teaching them to, to study for themselves and the Holy Spirit living with them, then guiding them and, and teaching them what is, what is a biblical church and how is it supposed to look. The Lord has really uh, has taught me quite a bit. There has been several, several times where we come to deal with something. I go, they never talked about this in Bible college. I remember the first time we did a marital counseling Joanna comes to me and she says, uh, the so-and-so couple, they're, they're having a fight and we need to go over to their house and uh, they, they need some counseling. They called, they said they need help. And I'm thinking we're going to get there and there's going to be, you know, heated words going on and whatnot. Well, Joanna meant they were having a fight. I mean, they were throwing blows, man. And the facetious side of me wanted to start off the conversation, well, who won? You know, you both look pretty banged up. Uh, you've got some good hits in there. Who who won? And so, you know, rule one is we don't hit our wife. I don't care what she does. You don't hit your wife back. And, and so going from just, I mean, this is some of the things we're dealing with of like, really? Like that, that this has to be taught. I thought everybody knew this, you know. Going from that to trying to get to a, a functioning body of Christ has been one of the most challenging, one of the most rewarding, one of the most exhausting things I've ever done. And I am learning that it is not who I who does it. Because everything that I try in my own strength and my own flesh to get done lasts about a week and a half, and then it goes to pot. 
But before we look into the passage and look into the Word, and, and, and before I share more what God has done, let's, uh, let's pray and just ask the Lord that He would work in this time. Father, I am grateful for the fact that You have chosen to, to work through Joanna and I in Madagascar. Lord, it is a privilege. Um, I know there are other people that are far better qualified, and... Lord, it is a testimony to your grace and your strength, what you have done. Lord, this morning, as we look at your word, uh, it is my desire that I would in no way distract from what you want to say, but that as we leave this place, we would be just enamored with your greatness, with your glory, and, and just struck by what you are doing in us and around us and through us, and that you would receive glory for it. And Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, just bless this morning, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As, you, as I look at the, the book of Ephesians, as I look at the teaching of Paul, there is, there is a different perspective I have now on it, having, having been a missionary, having been a pastor, having having gone through some of the pains of, 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 of praying, of pleading with God for your members to grow. And I understand a little bit better when, when, when Paul said, my greatest joy, and if I can remember it correctly outside in English, is that my children walk in truth. I have, a, I have a better perspective on that. Having been there and known the agony of watching church members fall after the world. Now, Joanne and I are expecting our first child in May, and so I can't say I can speak from experience of my own children being uh, naughty or, I'm sorry, I said I don't have a problem with English, but I do, Um, being, uh, being obedient or disobedient. But I can speak from the experience of watching my church members, who oftentimes were like kids, because, I mean, these are very young Christians, And as I read the book of Ephesians, the thing that I'm struck by is the joy that is in Paul and and almost a sense of amazement. And my desire is this, one from my own life, that God would show me, that God would place in my spirit, in my heart, the same zeal, the same joy, the same anticipation for what God is doing that you see in the life of Paul even though he was going through incredible circumstances, even though he was imprisoned, even though he was, they tried to stone him, even though he had so many people that are fighting against him, you see time and time again Paul going, man, if you could just get a glimpse of what God's doing. And I want to see that in my own life. Because so often, my response is, really, I got to do this, like, again? Did you not get the last sermon I preached? Like, where were you? We already talked about this six months ago, and you've forgotten it. Why are we going over this again? And I know uh, my parents could probably say the same thing. Bobby, why are you doing this again? You know, we, how many times have I told you? Well, we won't go into the illustrations. But, um, but in, verse, in chapter 3, verses starting in verse 14, I love just, you see the passion of Paul here, and he says this. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Paul's saying, look, you don't have a clue what God's doing here. The, The enormity... That's a word in English. The greatness of God's plan for your life, for my life, for his church. If we could just get a glimpse of that and get beyond our today, here, and now. My desire is that you would have the same joy that God has put in my heart, is what Paul is saying. And he says in verse 19, And to know the love of Christ, which which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. 
I believe that is the desire of God. Because he says, unto him be glory in the, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. God is working. God is planning. God is strategizing. God is moving in your life and my life because his desire is that when people see this church, they say, God's in that. That's the glory. Of, that is not normal. One of the greatest uh, blessings to Joanna and I that even probably goes beyond when somebody makes a profession of faith is watching people grow. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I am not at all diminishing the joy and the blessing when someone comes to Christ. But the reason I say this is professions are easy. It is very easy to raise your hand and say, I believe that Jesus died for me. But the proof that that belief is genuine, that it is true, is watching the Holy Spirit work and change and transform that life. Because I've come far across far too many people that raise their hand and say, I want to accept Christ. And on Monday they say, I accepted Christ. Thank you, Pastor. Now, do you have a job for me? I need money. I need rice. And, and so I don't want to be skeptical, but there's, there's a part of me after having lived in that for seven years that when somebody says, oh, yes, I want to believe in Jesus, my spirit goes, okay, praise the Lord. We're going to pray this is genuine. But when I see that person start to grow, start to read God's word, start to become excited about what God is doing in their life, I say, that's God. That's not their belly saying, I want more rice, and so I'm going to do what makes the white man happy, and therefore, hopefully, get what I want. That's the Holy Spirit. And so, when I see God working in somebody's life, transforming them, it brings, it, it, it's, it's, it's better than Christmas, You see, we tend to have a very uh, we tend to have a perspective on redemption of a, a point in our life, which is true. When we trust Christ as our Savior, when we become a child of God, that is a point in our life that you are then sealed, His forever. You cannot be, as they would say, unsaved. But the work of redemption, that's, that's, that's adopting us in the family of God, but the, the work of transforming us into the image of Christ so that when the world sees us, they see Christ, that's something that goes continually. And that is going to continue until Christ comes to get us. And I believe Paul is saying, look, I wish you guys could see what God is doing here. Because the fact of the matter is this. When, when, when my family gets together, okay, we're all the same blood. We've been around each other for a long time. And the fact of the matter is, before my family gets together, you know what I do? I pray. Why? Well, there's a lot of strong opinions in our family. And I qualify. And when you put a lot of strong opinions together, there's, there's a, a tendency for friction. And so I say, Lord, help me to be a blessing and not, not a curse. You know, help me to be, uh, you know, help us to provoke one another to love and good works and not just provoke one another. You know, and that's just within a family. But God says, no, look, I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going to take people from every tribe, race, creed, color, nation, culture, and I'm going to bring them together. I'm going to say, look, this is my body. This is my church. This is a unified whole. And and, and to be honest, if we were to decide that, that would, that's just crazy. You know, we look at all the, the, the racism and people stirring the pot of anger and strife in the country right now. And we say, we look at what we would define as liberals and say, man, would they just quit doing that? You know what, guys? That's sin. They're sinners. They're going to act sinful. Don't be surprised. But where they should see unity is here. And now my first point with this would be this. This is that we would realize God's plan. The title for the sermon is The Battle We Fight. Because often I think we don't realize we are in a battle right now, today. From the time you get up until the time you go to bed, to the time you drift off into sleep, you are in a battle. Satan, now probably not Satan himself, but him and his armies are fighting 
to take what God designed to share, to, to reflect his glory and reflect the world. You see, in, in Genesis, it's, we're told that we're created in the image of God. And the redemptive process is one that is so incredible. It's this. God is taking something that is marred by sin, redeeming it, forgiving it. He placed His Spirit in us. And His desire is to take that which was created in the image of God and so transform it so that when the world sees us, they see God. They see His attributes. They see His patience, His love, His joy. So that when they see us, they say, that is not the person I knew. That is something beyond them. And yet Satan is trying his best to discredit that. He's trying his best to take those who call themselves Christians and make them look just like the world. So that when the world sees and says, you call yourself a Christian, but you have the same struggles, you have the same problems, you have the same frustration, you have the same fights with your wife, your kids are just as disobedient. Why would I want what you have? I don't see any difference. And so what God is desiring to use for His glory, for His work, Satan's going, look, I can use that for a tool to benefit my kingdom as well. The question is, like Paul said, who are we going to yield our members to? The flesh? Or are we going to yield to God? So Paul is saying, Look, God is doing a work. God wants to use this church for His glory. And God has done such an incredible thing. In chapter 4, He says, verse 1, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with lowliness, with meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love. And then He goes on in verses 7 and following to say, look, God has given specific abilities, specific qualities, specific traits to each and every one of you. Yes, he gave pastors, evangelists, the, the apostles and prophets who were the writers of the scripture. He gave those for the edifying, for the building of Christ. But it, it is not limited to that. God wants to use each and every one of us. And the fact of, of the matter is this. If you're not using the gifts and abilities that God has given you in his body, you're selling the church short. There is not a single believer in this auditorium that is not needed. If you look down in verse 14 of chapter 4, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him, grow up into Christ, grow in Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, every one of us, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. That means every joint is helping another. Every joint is being filled with the fullness of God. In verse 16, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. I firmly believe Today, more so than I did seven years ago, more so than I did ten years ago, I believe that missions, evangelism, the spreading of the gospel is the natural result of a spirit-filled church. And a spirit-filled church is the natural result of a spirit-filled individual. You can't have a spirit-filled church if the individuals aren't spirit-filled. It can't happen. And if we're not walking in the power of the Spirit... And we go and try and, and, and crank out these, these good works, you're going to frustrate yourself. It's going to get old real fast. I've been there. I've done that. I still fight the temptation. And so, in Ephesians chapter 3, well, 2, he's talking about how he's bringing people from every group to make up his body. In chapter 3, he's talking about, look, if you could just get an idea of this. Chapter 4, he's showing how there's spiritual gifting given to each person, how God wants to use that. But there, there, there's something very specific in chapter 17 I want us to pay attention to, or chapter 4, verse 17, I want us to pay attention to. First, he gives them the idea, this is God's plan, his program, what he wants to do. But he says in, in verse 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as the other Gentiles walk. And I don't know about you, but anytime I'm reading the New Testament and I come across something where he starts talking about the Gentiles, there is a temptation to tune it out. There's a temptation to say, yeah, those people. 
I'm, I'm so glad I'm, I'm not one of them anymore. And in the New Testament, when he talks about Gentiles, he's talking about the unregenerate, those who have not, who have not believed in, in Christ as a whole. There are times when he's specifically talking about the Gentiles versus the Jews. But in this re- reference, he's talking to a Jew-Gentile group. And so he says Gentiles, he's talking about the unregenerate. And he says, don't walk like them. Now, why in the scripture does any writer give a warning? I ask you parents, why do you warn your kids? Dad used to tell the story, and still does often, of when he was a kid and his mom would send him out in the snow all bundled up. And the last thing she said to him one day before she sent him out was, don't stick your tongue in the metal fence. And he says, I would have never thought to stick my tongue in the metal fence if mom hadn't done it or hadn't said it. So what's the first thing he did? He went and stuck his tongue in the metal fence. Got stuck there, and he was so scared his mom was going to come spank him while he was stuck to the metal fence that he ripped his tongue off on it. So to this day, he still can't taste that well. But uh, no, why do we warn our kids of things? Because we know that's a danger. Uh, so, and I believe Paul is, is putting this warning, this, this, this admonishment in here, because why? Because it's a danger. It's a temptation. He says, this, I say therefore, testify in the Lord, that you walk not as other, other Gentiles. And I want to look at these four specific things. First, in the vanity of their mind. This is the temptation of the world for us today. To walk in the vanity of their mind. What is the vanity of their mind? If you look at that word vanity... Uh, it obviously has the implication or the idea of something that is worthless, something that's futile. But if you go and you trace the word back, it comes back from the root word that is actually tied to idols. We were looking in Jeremiah today when he talks about the, 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 the copper smith and the goldsmith, and it says, the works of their hands which are vain. Because to pray to an idol is a worthless act. You're not going to get anything from it. It can't help you. But then in the New Testament, he talks about covetousness, which is as idolatry. Why? Because Satan wants us to focus on the here and now, the things that don't last, the things that are going to burn up, the things that have no eternal reward. I was thinking about this morning. Um, you know, we, I'm a car guy. I bought a cheap truck, paid 200 bucks for a truck a few months ago, and I'm rebuilding it with the thought of selling it and making a profit of it, also because I don't want to drive my wife nuts when we're not traveling and speaking. So I need something to keep me going. So I've been rebuilding this truck, but as I'm working on it, I'm thinking, you know, one day this truck is going to fall apart. I mean, it's close to it right now. Hopefully it'll get better, but it's going to, it's going to fall apart again eventually. And why is it that antiques, antique vehicles and those things, are worth so much when they're in good condition. Because it takes so much work to keep them that way. You know, how many of these things, they fall apart. The natural decay process of this world is that it's going to get worse. And it takes a lot of time and money to keep things up. You know, if, if, if the old VW bugs were as plentiful as the new ones, they wouldn't be worth what they are anymore. But the fact of the matter is things, they, they decay. They're a vanity. There is no eternal reward in them. And Paul says, be careful that you don't walk in the vanity of your mind. I would say the majority, if not all, sin starts here. With a thinking, a perspective, a priority that is not eternal. And Paul's saying, look, if you could have the perspective of this is what God is doing. This is how he wants to use you. This is how he wants to put you guys together. This is how he's using his body in a way that glorifies him. But beware, there's a vanity out there. You start focusing on that, you're going to miss this. You start focusing on that which is futile, which is equivalent to idolatry, you're going to miss the glory of the true God. And what is the result of that? Because they walk in the vanity of their mind, because they're focusing on that which doesn't last, because they're, they're living for this world, verse 18, their understanding is darkened. And following that, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Why? 
What does that mean for us? Because Paul was talking to whom? Or to whom was Paul talking? He wasn't talking to the non-believers. He's using the non-believers as an example to warn the Christians. They start with the vanity of their mind. They end up with their understanding darkened. Okay, if he's talking to me and you, what is the real possibility here? If we walk in the vanity of our mind, what's going to be the result? Our spiritual understanding is going to be darkened. How many, have, how many Christians have we met that blab on and on about spiritual things, but you know they're walking in a sinful lifestyle, and their talk is just idle talk? It's like, bro, you don't get it. You know, you can talk all you want, but your life proves otherwise. And they become, functionally speaking, alienated from a life, uh, alienated from the life of God. You see no power... Uh, Forgive me, in Malagasy, word structure is literally like Yoda speak. So if something comes out backwards, it's English with Yoda, vocab uh, Yoda vocabulary, Malagasy vocabulary. They literally, uh, functionally, there is no power of God in their life. I think of when Paul talked about the ones that, uh, and I believe at that point he was talking about people that were not saved, but they were following customs, traditions, rituals, and he said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I can, I can tell you from experience, when, when you're working to have a form of godliness without God's power, it's exhausting. It is exhausting. And you can fake joy for a while, but it'll burn out. And Paul said, I don't want that for you. I don't. Beware, because it starts with what? Walking in the vanity of your mind. Being alienated from a life of God through the ignorances that, that is in them because of what? The blindness of their heart. Now, as a, as a pastor in Madagascar, one of my jobs is to, when there's somebody living an ungodly lifestyle, I get the privilege of going and talking and saying, buddy, this doesn't work. Look at what the scripture says. And that conversation is generally not fun. Most people... This may be why people, you know, hide when they see pastor coming. Say, oh, man, he's coming to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Well, that's one of my responsibilities. Say, look, this is what the Bible says, and this is what you're doing. And I don't want you living like that because you're not going to be experiencing the benefit of God as long as you live in this lifestyle. But because of the blindness of their heart, I cannot tell you how many times I've, I've gone and I've taken other men, and I, and I will be speaking to somebody about some, some lifestyle, you know, they're, they're living in fornication or something else, and I typically try and bring a Malagasy with me just so that they can have practice in this, this, uh, this, it's not art, this work of admonishing the brethren. I can't tell you how many times it will leave and they'll say, Pastor, it was so clear the verse you gave. Like the verse said, don't do this, do this. And the person is obviously wrong. And yet the person who is living in sin says, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Because the most spiritually blind person is the one who's living in sin. And you can point out all day long, no, that's not biblical, that's not holy, that's not according to godliness. And they go, I don't see anything. Why is it? Because they start in the vanity of their mind. And after that, they moved on to having their understanding darkened. And as they became separated from God and became used to this just cranking out, trying to, trying to force the work of God in their own flesh, they think it's the norm. And they become so blind to the fact that, no, this is not what God intended ever for us to be living in, that when you say, this is not right, they say, I don't see it. When we first, when we first arrived in Madagascar, the, uh, the, as I said, the emphasis was, was evangelism. And it People do not come to Christ quickly in Madagascar. There was a village we went to. It took us, it was about 14 miles away. It would take us um, 45 minutes to an hour to get to it because we were going through the bush. And I remember when I first started there, we had to start with creation. Who is God? Now, I don't know what you guys are encountering here in America these days with, with, with evangelism. But when I was starting with who is God, that's both a rewarding task and, and a challenging one. Um, rewarding because you're not sifting through so much incorrect beliefs. 
but challenging because there is so much to explain. You know, like, who's Adam? Well, he was the first man. I mean, everybody came from one man? Well, yes, everybody came from one man. And, uh, but that, that work of, of, of explaining the gospel and getting people to where they come to, they realize sin, a holy God, a perfect, complete sacrifice. It's finished, done for you. All you have to do is believe to receive it. I used to think that was the hard work. But what I am seeing now is the battle really starts once they get saved. The, the work of somebody who is now a professing believer, who is, who is supposed to be walking with God, and the temptation to go back to living like the world, when all your family, when all your relatives, when all your friends are saying, why do you do that? Okay, we're, we're going to get drunk and pray to the ancestors today, and you need to be with us. And the incredible peer pressure that comes to those believers, because everyone in my church is a first-generation Christian. Every one of them. And the majority of them, their entire family is against them in the fact that they're no longer worshiping the ancestors. Because you have to understand this. In the Malagasy mindset, I worship my ancestors today so that when I die, my descendants will worship me. And through that, there is, there is a form of, 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 of of, of praise, of, of worship that the ancestors receive, and they're almost an empowering. And so if somebody comes and says, you know what, I don't worship the ancestors anymore, I don't, I, I don't pray to them anymore, I follow Christ, I don't give my, my, my parents whatever they ask for, whatever money they want, whatever my clothing, housing, uh, housing whatever I have, the parents basically ask and they're supposed to give it. It's, it's the Malagasy form of retirement. I have a lot of kids, they get a lot of stuff, I ask them for whatever they want and they give it to me. So when we turn this on its head and say, no, look, you now serve Christ, not the ancestors. Now, you, you honor your parents, but you don't serve them. We're messing up the Malagasy 401k. And they get hot mad. I mean, it's how dare you tell my son that he doesn't need to pray to my dead father. You're dishonoring them. And we have people that put curses on their kids because they turn to Christ. And our, and our believers are literally terrified. Pastor, they're going to go to the witch doctor and put a curse on me. And these things are real. I mean, it's, uh, there is a spiritual battle. We'll see that in a little bit here. Uh, people do get sick. Uh, this, though we don't see it here in America so much in our face, it's legit. And so the temptation to follow that, is, is, is beyond anything I've ever uh, experienced. But Paul says, and I love how he turns it in, verse four, in chapter 4, um, verse 20. He has one short phrase. He says, but ye have not so learned in Christ. That system, that vanity, that's not what you learn in Christ. Don't follow that. I was, I was listening over uh, Pastor John's, some of his sermons he's done previously. And I, I love the, the illustration that he gave of Romans 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, of being conformed, having the, the, the outward pressuring you, forcing you into a, into a, a routine or a, a structure, as opposed to transform which comes from within. And I see that so much in our churches. They want to know what, our, what they call their fumba. What's the fumba in this church? What's the tradition? What's, what, do you, what do you practice? How do we do? Do we kneel this time? Do we stand up? Do we, do we have something we recite? Do we, I say, we follow the Lord in the Bible. But you don't have a fumba? You don't have a tradition? No, no, no. We have the Holy Spirit within inside us. You know, it's not like you've know, you got to say this so many times, and you've got to repeat this so many times, and you stand here, and you sit there. And they don't know how to handle that. But Paul says, look, that system... You didn't learn that in Christ. Don't bring that with you. Don't bring that baggage into the church. <laughs> you have not so learned Christ. So he gives us two very different things. He says, this is God's plan. This is the temptation to go back to. And because there's these two very different worlds, if we could skip to chapter 6, and I don't wanna, I'm not trying to do injustice to the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5. I just don't have, we don't have time to look at all of it. But in chapter 6, after having put pain to these two very different pictures and the choice that there is for them, he says in chapter, chapter 6, 
verse 12, he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I don't I don't want to I don't want to try and wow you with stories of freakiness in Madagascar but I will say this we are very aware of that spiritual battle when we look at the life of Job you see that there is a spiritual battle going on and we saw the evidence lived out in the, in the life of his kids uh, just uh, uh, maybe six months ago, the Bowens had just moved out to Mount Tirana with us. And uh, they were living in the downstairs of our house, and we live in the upstairs. And, and Brandon said, man, last night, my kid just started screaming. I couldn't find anything. She wasn't hurting. There was no sick. There was no bugs in the bed. There was no, there was no centipedes. There was no spiders. They was just screaming. I said, Brandon, you need to pray. And he kind of looked at me like, uh, Bobby? Something I need to know here? I said, no, no, seriously, dude, you need to pray. The first night, the first few weeks that we were in the house that we were in, uh, we were, I had, I, had, I had known about spiritual warfare. I had read books, having worked in the Amazon a little with missionaries down there. I had, I'd heard stories and whatnot, but I had never really encountered it firsthand. But we were living in our house for a few weeks, and one night I woke up to uh, a door opening and closing and opening and closing. I thought, we left a... Uh, Left something open somewhere. Got to latch something. It's blowing in the wind. Well, being the good, brave missionary I was, I got my shotgun and started looking for this door that was opening and closing. And uh, and I'm going through the house and I'm opening each door. And our doors, they don't have knobs. They've got like slide locks. And so you have to open the slide and push it. And I'm going around and I'm saying, I can't find anything open anywhere. And uh, it's pitch black. I've got a flashlight in one hand and a gun in the other. And I get to the last door, and I know that this room has a, uh, a door that goes to the outside, and that door that goes to the outside is not very strong. It's, it's easy, actually, to break in through the outside. And so I always keep the inner door locked from the inside, so if they break into the outside room, they, or to that room, they can't get in the rest of the house. And so it's the last room. It's pitch black, middle of the night, and I slide it open, and I start creaking, cracking open, and I forgot there was a, a, a bamboo chair that was just inside the door. Well, in the dark... With the flashlight, semi-asleep, that bamboo chair looked like an arm. I scared myself silly. About shot the bamboo chair. And so I just had to sit there for a while and, and, and calm down. I never found anything that was open. Now, the noise was very real. I wasn't sleepwalking. The noise was very real, but I never found anything that was open. And I just stopped. I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what this noise is. I don't know where it's coming from but I need to sleep. So would you take care of it? I went to bed never heard again. It's never come back since. I thought that was the end of it. Well, just this past August, we are, we are, I'm driving back from camp. I've got a load of teenagers and a military escort with me in the car, and, and Brandon behind me, he has another group of te like 10 teenagers in his car and another military escort, and we're driving... Through the, through, through the bush, it's dark, it's an area that's known for bandits, so I'm already, you know, on guard and, and keeping my eyes open in case there's any type of ambush or whatnot, and, and we've been driving for like uh, 18 hours, so I'm exhausted on top of that, and, and the military guy starts talking about things that he's seen. Now, the military guy is not saved, he's lost as a goose, and, the, and he worshiped his ancestors and everything else like that, and they start talking about this, this, this animal that comes and steals babies and carries it off in the woods and has red eyes. I'm going, okay. I'm trying to concentrate on driving. I'm exhausted. Maybe I'm not understanding the Malagasy that well. So I start asking questions. What are you talking about? Well, it has hair like this, and it's like this size. And, and I'm thinking of my repertoire of animals I've seen in Madagascar, and I can't come up with any of them. I'm going, what in the world? And so I start asking uh, one of the, one, the women that was with us was our maid. I said, Mima, what is he talking about? Because I'm like, maybe this guy's just off. She's like, no, no, I've seen one. And she starts describing it. I said, well, is it, is it a lemur? No. Is it a pig? 
No. Is it a crocodile? No. And finally they say it is an animal who can take the form of a man. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we talking about? I said, oh, you're talking about a demon. And they said, well, maybe. And uh, now, if it hadn't been for one of my believers in the church said, Pastor, I've seen it. This is not a joke. It's not there. I would have just dismissed it as, and for my American mindset, it doesn't happen. And at that point, I said, Pastor, do you know the woman in white's been coming to my, when, when I take care of your house, the woman in white shows up. I said, what woman in white? She said, well, I'll wake up and there's somebody standing at the end of my bed. I said, Mima, what do you do? Because Mima, I know, is saved. I said, what do you do? She said, I look at him and I say, I don't serve you anymore. Get out of here. I'm saved. I serve God. And I said, what is it? They, they leave. I said, my understanding of this spiritual battle is like this. I have no, I mean, I was, I was, I was so proud of my believers because I hadn't taught them that. I don't experience that. You know, I say, God, take care of it. I'm going to bed. But yet the fact of the matter is this. People say, why, do you, why does that happen in Africa and doesn't happen here in the States? It's not because there's not a battle here. I believe the, answer, the reason we have that there and not here is because if they see that there, what do they do? They run to the witch doctor and say, I've got a problem. You've got to take care of this. If we woke up and somebody's standing in our bed, we run a church, say, Pastor, what in the world's going on here? Those things drive us to God. Those things drive the Malagasy into ancestral worship. Satan knows his tools. He knows his people. He's not stupid. Why do we not have it here? Satan doesn't need it. He has us so distracted that he doesn't need another tool. My dad recently got a new TV, and I'm not against new TVs, don't get me wrong. But we were going through the setup of this new TV, and I came across something that said this, apps for passing the time. And I looked at that, and I thought, really? Now, not, don't get me wrong. I understand. There are times when you are tired, and you just need to, to chill and, and recover. I get that. I do that. And if, and if you want to use TV to do that, I have no issue with you doing that. But I looked at that. I'm looking for an app simply to pass time. And yet if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, he says you're supposed to be redeeming the time, not passing the time. Satan is all too thrilled when the church of God sits down and says, I'm just going to pass my time here until Jesus comes. And Paul says, no, 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 no. God gifted you, he equipped you, he filled you so that you can then do his work in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Satan says, just, just sit back and pass the time. Make sure you fill your pew. <laughs> Nod, don't fall asleep. Go home and watch the football game. Now, I'm not against football either, don't, you know. <laughs> but I feel like so often I am blind to the battle that's going on. And when Paul is saying, you should be standing and ready for the fight, we're sitting down past the time, and we get caught off guard going, where did that one come from? I think we have far too little of a realization of the impact that our individual private life has on the body of Christ. I can tell you, when I've had a bad week, when Joanne and I are not getting along, when I just want to chill, when I am just fed up with the Malagasy people, with the ministry, I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to do what Bobby wants to do, and that's it. I see it in the lives of my believers on Sunday. And it strikes my heart, says, Bobby, you're supposed to be a leader. And how in the world are you going to go and correct this person of this sin when you're living like this in private? Are you aware of what God wants to do with you, in you, through you, around you? 
I will say this from the limited times that I've truly been walking according to the Spirit and seeing God work, it, 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 it blows my mind. I come, back, I come away from it going, that was a God moment. Two years ago, uh, July, of 20, July of 2017, Charity had just passed away the April before. Um, it was really hard in Madagascar. We were still by ourselves. Well, I guess Donnie was there, our, our single missionary that was work. But I mean, it was, I mean, we were grinding through the ministry at that point, just exhausted. It was hot. We had teamed up with another missionary in the capital to hold a youth camp. I don't know why we thought that was a good idea when we already had too much on our plate, but we thought it was a good idea, so we tried it. So we packed, uh, how many people did we put in the excursion? 14? Yeah, 14 people in the excursion, all the equipment and gear in a trailer behind the excursion, and went to camp. It took us a day and a half to get to camp. We were at camp for three and a half days. And on the last morning, like I'm already in, I'm already in return mode. Like I'm thinking about the vehicles and the equipment and making sure we have the food for all the kids and everything. And, and I had left the excursion in the capital because I had some issues with it and I was afraid to take it. So I left it there. And I, and I knew when I leave this camp, I have to get back and deal with the vehicle quickly so that we can get on the road and get home. And uh, Ben decides to have one last service that Thursday morning. And I thought, Ben, we're tired. We've been having services several times a day for three and a half days. You know, we let it go. <laughs> Let's go home. You know, maybe next year something will happen. And he holds a service. And, and as the service is going, I'm, you know, looking at my watch. Like, you know, every hour that we're here is another hour on the road. And, and then, he, then he does an invitation. And uh, I, I didn't have the best of attitude. But nothing much started happening. But then... People begin to respond, and, and uh, suddenly it was like the, the dam broke loose. And four of the, of the teens that came with us, three of them were, were cousins, and one was just by himself, came to us. And, and three of these kids we've been praying for for years. And they just, they would not accept Christ because they were afraid if they accepted Christ, that pastor might call on them to read the Bible during a Sunday service. That is the honest truth. But I would not tell them, no, I'm not going to call on you to read the Bible if you accept Christ. Why? Personally, I, I believe if, if that is all that is keeping you from accepting Christ, I don't, God might ask me to do something. I'm not going to get saved. Then, then there's something else that's going on. I mean, I, when I see the New Testament, somebody comes to Christ, I mean, they're like, dude, I, whatever God wants me to do, you know, however he wants me to use you, I'll do that. Um, so we've been praying and praying and praying, and finally all three of the cousins came and said, we want to accept Christ. I said, sure, yes, we want to accept Christ now. And so they, they, the three of them prayed to receive Christ, and then Ahavu said this fourth accepted Christ. And, and I mean, I was just on cloud nine. I could not wait to tell their grandfather. Uh, their grandfather was Justin, the, the guy that you guys helped with the roof repair his house. It was his grandkids, and Justin had been praying for years for his grandkids to get saved. And so they accepted Christ, and we head back. I mean, I'm, a, I'm on cloud nine. I'm like, I cannot wait to tell Justin, you know, so, so much more of his family is now saved. And we get back, and I should have, I should have known, I should, I should have taken the clue. I get back to, to, to Tana, and I go to start the excursion, and it begins doing something that you see like on a sci-fi movie when the aliens come. I mean, lights going off everywhere, and what in the world is going on? Now, me, as a, as a trained mechanic, I'm going through every you know, possible scenario, and, and nothing makes sense. I'm going, Lord, this goes beyond anything I've ever seen. Well, it ended up being, I was able to fix it with the battery, but that was just the beginning of it. Then we had to go through and flush the transmission because Richard had almost burnt the transmission out before he came and it started slipping and having issues. So then I had to spend a day fixing the transmission, replacing the battery. That was day one. So we didn't get to leave that day. We left the next day. On the way to the end of the paved road, the brakes started acting up. And the one thing I forgot to bring was a C-clamp. So I'm out there with a shovel trying to fix the brakes. And uh, that 
got us hobbled on to our next destination. We get to the end of the paved road. We stop there for the night because we have uh, 250 miles of dirt road to go, and I needed a good rest. So we, we slept that night, get up early in the morning, start heading out, get two hours down the road, and the trailer axle cracks. I'm like, I'm making progress this way. I don't want to go back that way, but, you know. So we, we flip the trailer axle over, drive for another we'll hobble along from the way so I find a place that they have a piece of welding rod. Then I took the batteries out of the truck and connected them up and did some sort of MacGyver thing. I wasn't sure it was going to work or if it was going to blow up or what. And we were able to weld it somewhat and drove for another two hours. And at this point, pride comes before fall because I was so proud of my MacGyver moment of welding the truck axle or the trailer axle and that we're going down the road again. Right about that point, I see the, the wheel go bouncing down the mountain. <laughs> Literally fall. So at that point, we have to find a tree that we can cut down, that we can shove under the trailer to make a skid for the left side, go recover the wheel and put that back on, drive for a couple more hours till we can find a military stop where we can leave the trailer. Then we make the not-so-wise decision to take everything out of the trailer and put it on top of the excursion. So now we have 14 people in the excursion, all the gear on top of the excursion. The brakes have already started messing up, and uh, the thing has a problem with overheating, or the transmission is getting hot. So we're going down the mountain, and right before I go down the mountain, I realize that there's something wrong with the shifter. And I no longer have park first or second in an automatic transmission with brakes that are having problems going down a mountain with a kid with 14 people in the load on the top. And I'm going, this is a bad situation. Going down the mountain, the brakes start having problems again, so we stop and fix that. And by now it's dark, and we keep going. And I'm going, Lord, what is going on? I mean, I spent days working on this vehicle trying to get it ready for this trip, and everything is falling apart. It was like the Holy Spirit said, Bobby, you're in a battle. God just had a victory. Satan is not happy. Next day, we're driving down the road, and the farther I go, the more the wheel starts turning to go straight. This is not normal. Next time I hear this rumbling in the back, I go back. The right leaf spring pin is cracked, and the axle is falling off slowly and riding into the back of the vehicle. I thought, wow, this one's going to be fun. So we work on it, shove it back in place, drive for another two miles. It so the same thing. Then we're taking straps and strapping the axle to the front of the vehicle and a whole bunch of rigmarole and drive for another 45 minutes. And then it sounds like somebody's hitting the bottom of the vehicle with a sledgehammer. What now? I got a steering wheel. Then <laughs> I go look on the left side. The left leaf spring is cracked in half. So I got straps holding the right side. The left side's cracked in half. The shifter doesn't work. The, steer well, the steering is somewhat okay. The brakes don't work. And by this time, we've been driving for two and a half days. We're about out of water. We're out of food. We have no cell phone reception. And there is no town within hours. And I got 14 people there in the middle of bandit territory. Lord, this was not in Bible college training. I parked it going down a, a hill. I, I ran the truck into a tree and parked it there because I had no park. I had no emergency brake because the axle was literally broken off the truck. And uh, we jack it up, and I'm trying to work on this thing, and I'm pulling every, every, every trick out of my hat, everything I know of, every tool I can find, and I'm getting to the point where physically I can't turn the wrench anymore. I mean, I'm exhausted, I'm hungry, and I'm thirsty. And we have no supplies. I'm going, Lord, this is getting pretty desperate. I need help. I have no idea what to do. I'm texting Richard, Richard, this is getting bad. And the worst part of all of it is I've got 14 teenagers. Four of them have just trusted Christ, and they're watching pastor to see how, the, how does pastor respond to frustration. And I can't express myself. I mean, there were so many things that I wanted to say that I just had to say, praise the Lord, this thing's broken. <laughs> And I'm sitting there praying, Lord, what are you? What is going on? And finally, a vehicle comes. And uh, and, I, and I'm I'm still trying to, to force, like I can do this, I can do this, I can't do this. And the vehicle that comes is the Malagasy military. Now, me and the Malagasy military have an interesting relationship because a lot of them are corrupt. But I've also watched some Malagasy fix vehicles, and I tend to don't touch anything on my car, because if you touch it, it's going to be a problem later on. But at this point, they showed up, and I just stepped back. I said, have at it. I'm done. 
I have no strength. I have, my, I have no parts. I have no energy. They gave us bottles of Coke and Sprite, stuff that is, is precious to them, expensive, uh, just to help the teens, you know, so they have something to drink. And between me and three other of the military guys, we were able to jimmy-rig the vehicle to where we have ratchet straps holding the one side together, a non-standard bolt that is shoved in, in, the, in the leaf spring holding that side together. The, the pin is, yeah. well, I work with that on the shifter. And they got us on the road again. And for five hours, we creeped over every rock and crevice, hoping that it's not gonna, something else is not going to snap. And I remember I got home, and I just felt, I was just, I was beat. I was exhausted. But it wasn't just the physical stress. It was, this is a battle. And Satan's going, are, are you going to trust the Lord? Are you going to, not, not even, are you going to persevere? Because I wasn't persevering. My spirit was going, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I'm done. Leave me alone. But I couldn't go anywhere. So I, I was stuck. And I've, on the mission field, I've said this so many times, Lord, I, I, I'm done. I don't have anything left in me. And I, can, I can't tell you how many times when I come to that place of I am done, I'm fed up, my options didn't work. God does one of two things. He says, you're right, you are done, and now my grace can start. Or two, he says, you're right, this is too much, let me take this off your plate. This, this, this thing that was, that was so weighing so heavily that you're not sleeping over, that was worrying, this responsibility, actually, you don't need to take care of that. And the government make a new policy and say, that's not required anymore. And you go, well, praise the Lord, I'll have to take care of that. And I spent how many days figuring out, trying to figure out how I'm going to finish this? This paperwork, this, this visa, this renewal, this person that's wanting a bribe, this, this believer that is just the stubborn and living in sin, God says, look, I can take care of them. Watch this. I'll change their heart. And so that's why my desire is to, like Paul, say, Lord, give me a glimpse of what you're doing. That is beyond me. Yes, there is a battle, there is a fight, we are in it. But give me a glimpse of what you're doing. Maybe I don't know what the outcome is going to be or how you're going to do it. But give me the faith that when, when you bring obstacles, when our coworker uh, dies because of cancer, when the Lord takes our child for reasons we don't know, that I say, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. Give me the grace to keep going. And so that we can say as Paul, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That whether by life or by death, God may be glorified in my body. Because there is something about knowing what I am living for is not vain. I mean, have you ever, have you ever done a job and you know this is pointless, like you're doing it because you've been told by your boss to do it, or you're doing it because, but you know this isn't going to last. You know, I'm going to be doing this again next week, like pulling weeds. I mean, I was in the landscape, but I hated pulling weeds. Round up the whole thing, you know? Be done with it. But to know this has an eternal value. Why? Because God is doing it. Not because it's me. Not because I'm anything special. But God gave me what he did because he wants to do in me what I cannot do in myself. So that when the, Lord, when the world looks at me, they see the Lord. When your family, when your friends, when your co-workers look at you, when they look at this church, what do they see? Now, I will say this. I, am, I know this church, probably more so than most churches I, I come across, this church has a large majority involved in it. There is a large majority of you that are actively involved in serving the Lord and using the gifts that He's given you. But I say this to you to warn you because you have that. Because it's very easy to look around and say, well, compared to them and them, we're doing good. And to begin to coast. And right when you think you've got it good and you're beginning to coast, 
That's when you get smacked. Beware. I thank the Lord for what he has done. In this church, you guys have been a blessing and encouragement to us so many times. When we were on that road, and problem after problem, actually, I counted up, there was over 10 repairs we did on the road. The one thing that kept us going was obviously the grace of the Lord, but we knew, because thankfully my mom is very good at sending out things on Facebook and everywhere else and texting tens of people, we knew there was an army back here praying for us. We knew that there were people that knew what was going on, and when we were sleeping or when we were just trying to make it to the middle of the night, there was people awake here that were praying for us. Why? Because we are part of the Lord's army. And so, beyond the financial support and the encouragement, the notes and stuff like that, we're working together. And the Lord is doing something incredible that we may not see until he comes back. But my desire is this, that God would be sharing with us, this is the picture, this is what I want you for. I want to use you. It is a battle. Beware of the temptation. But know that God, it is He, He who called us will also do it. It's He who works in us. And to Him be all the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessing of, of one being able to be called your child. Lord, when we think of the fact of Christ coming to earth, living a, a perfect life, dying in our place, only to redeem those who, who really don't even seek after you, Lord, it's, it's incredible. But now the privilege of being able to serve you, to be used of you, to be called your own, would help us to see the joy, the, the peace that comes from walking with you. And Lord, I, my, my prayer for this church, for my own life, for the church in my Toronto is that we would be vessels that are as fit for your use. And we pray this all in Jesus' name.